morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to your welcoming space here. In this very beautiful venue, every time I have visited this space, I have been able to acknowledge not just the faces that I see in front of me and the bodies that occupy this space, but somehow as I was speaking to Cheryl this morning, I said I can also sense the energies that perhaps my eyes cannot see. You are blessed with a beautiful space and a, and a very powerful aura. I hope we are able to take some of it with us wherever we head out today from here. It is my pleasure to be with you this morning uh, and a pleasure again to be here with Cheryl. Thank you for that very generous introduction, Cheryl. Yes, we have been co-conspirators. We have studied, we have taught, we have written, we have researched together, and we are now plotting for something more. Um, tomorrow will be the first month of the 12th lunar year in the Islamic almanac or calendar. And that month is called the month of Hajj. And Hajj is one of the tenets of faith for Muslim communities. And as the scripture that was recited just before I stepped up here, it is incumbent, interestingly enough, the words of the Quran say, not just for Muslims, but for all humankind. Many ways of interpreting that. But I chose these verses because these are invitations to all humankind. I don't really like these translations where the word insan in Arabic is translated as mankind, but it really means humankind. So I wanted to take some time, and I will stay well within my time, to give you uh, or to share with you a few reflections of what the pilgrimage of Hajj entails. And I'm going to focus on how it is an embodiment of sacred history, and not just the sacred past, but also a reminder to embody the ethics that those stories remind us of. So the first 10 days of this month, which is known as the month of Hajj, translated Dhul Hajjah, the month of Hajj, are very important historically and spiritually. So when we look at the narratives of prophets in the Quran, the first 10 days are very special in the narrative of Moses. I'm sure you'd find resonance in how the Genesis story or the other biblical accounts of Moses are, where he had an appointment with God and he was supposed to spend 30 days, and this is according to the narrative of the Quran. The Quran says, we booked him for 30 days and then we decided to extend that for another 10 days until he completed a 40-day spiritual retreat, so to speak. And only then was he granted the Torah, and he came down to his congregation and he was able to share those messages. And there are hadith or prophetic traditions that say that the 10 days were these 10 days that start from tomorrow. So in the Muslim tradition and in Muslim communities, these first 10 days of the month of Hajj are spiritually uplifting. These are those extended days of worship that God demanded from Moses. Those specific days and night where we recalibrate our moral compass and we try to seek revelation and the whisperings of the divine in our hearts and our minds. So the 10 days are really specifically important for the narrative of Moses, but then they are absolutely important in reliving the narrative of Abraham. And I'm going to share with you very um, sparingly the long narrative, but I want to stick to what that has to do with Hajj. And in Abraham's narrative, you have his wife, Sarah, and you have this other woman in his life who is Hagar, and the Hajj narrative is tied to what happens to Hagar and her infant child, who according to the Islamic tradition is Ismail or Ishmael, who is then set up for sacrifice 
at the stones in Mina, which is a place in Saudi Arabia. So I've written an article about Hagar, and you'll find it in the Berkeley Journal of Religion and Theology, so I'm not going to use my feminist lens to read this. Today I decided to stick to spirituality and ethics in, in my talk today. So I've written a whole article on how God has chosen this woman who has been oppressed because of her gender, because she's a woman, because of her class, because she's a slave, and also because she is a person of color, because of her race. And God takes this woman who has been marginalized because of all these factors, and then allows her to be one of the pioneers who built the Kaaba. And not only that, she is also buried in the Kaaba. I'm not sure if Muslims realize that what they circumambulate when they go for their Hajj is actually walking around the grave of a woman. But like I said, I'm not going to be tempted to go in that direction. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk to you about five rituals out of the 13 rituals that Muslims who don the robes of pilgrims and head out to Mecca will perform. And I have chosen these five rituals because I find them rich in ethics, rich in the ways that they can contribute to our lives today, and rich in ways that they can help us to seek sanctuary within our own faith traditions. The scripture started off with calling the house of God the most ancient house, the first house that was created. Again, in the Muslim paradigm, when the globe was just water, the first piece of land that landed on that body of water was where the Kaaba stands today. So in the Muslim paradigm, that is the vortex center. All spirituality emanates from there. And that is why wherever mosques are built in the world today, they all orient themselves towards the Kaaba. And wherever Muslims worship, be that in churches or in their homes or in their offices or in parking lots where you'll see Muslims put their mat down and get ready to pray, they're orienting themselves towards the Kaaba. So this becomes the energy central for Muslims when they're seeking spirituality. And that is also a place of sanctuary. It's a safe space for all humankind. And this safe space was built by this mother and this son. And God loved the worship of the mother so much that he infused what the mother did, Hagar, into the 13 rituals that all Muslims are mandated to carry out if they want to fruitfully complete their pilgrimage. I'm going to start with ritual number one, and that is the donning of the pilgrim robes. Now this in Arabic is called ihram, and ihram means sanctified, so when the intention is made to make to the journey, make the journey to the house of God, and the pilgrim dons her robes, she is removing every other identity that she wears. She is removing every mask that she wears. And she is seeking the human in her. In the legal aspects of the donning of the robes, you would see that people wear something that is white, that resembles a shroud, a covering on the top and a covering below. And everyone who enters the sanctuary needs to wear the same dress. As if to say that every title you wear, every accolade on your head, everything needs to be dismantled. And you come as you came into this world, dressed in white, 
and you will come as if you come on the day of judgment in your white shrouds. So the intentionality here is, I am not the gendered identity that I'm told I am. I'm not the status that is given to me in this world. I'm not the title that is awarded to me. I am a human being. And when everyone, the four million who perform Hajj each year, entered the sanctuary, they all are dressed in the same garment. And it's so difficult to make out the officer from the clerk or the king from the servant. Everyone is in the same clothes. So the ihram or the donning of the robes is a reminder of seeking my human identity. Not just within myself, but also to look past all the masks and all the intersectional identities and find and seek the human other in the congregation. The next ritual that I want to talk to you about is circumambulating the house of God. And somehow, almost every ritual you do in Hajj is in turns of seven. And there are many mystical interpretations of why everything has to be done seven times. And one of those interpretations is perhaps because it is a number that denotes perfection or completion, like the seven notes of music, the seven colors in the spectrum. So perhaps this is why everything is done seven times. And you would see that the Hajj pilgrims would circumambulate the house of God seven times. And they would do it anti-clockwise. And one of the mystical or spiritual interpretations of doing this anti-clockwise is because it is an undoing or an untying of everything that has bogged me down in life's experiences. We all carry our burdens. We all carry our demons. We all carry our limitations. And perhaps the circumambulation of the house is a reminder to undo, unlock. With each round that I take around the house of God, I remove a burden, I remove a limitation. And hopefully by the time I'm done, I emerge with my essential potential and my powers and the faculties that God had gifted me in my spirit and in my heart. The third ritual is the ritual of Sa'i. Sa'i literally translated means striving, trying, and endeavor. And this is an exact embodiment of what Hagar did. The narrative is that she had the infant Ismail, and Abraham had left Hagar and Ismail in the middle of nowhere. There was no other human tribe there. There was no vegetation. There was no water. It was literally in the middle of the desert. And when the babes became agitated with thirst and started to scream, the mother wondered where she would find water from. So there were two mountains, the mountain of Safa and the mountain of Marwa. So what does the mother do? She runs between the two mountains. And because there are mountains, every time she comes into the valley, she's not able to see her baby. So she treads faster. She almost jogs until she can come to a high point where she's able to see her baby. And she feels a little relaxed. And today, when people go for Hajj, they do the same thing. They walk seven times between the two mountains of Safa and Marwa, literally embodying and emulating what Hagar did even down to the marks where when she jogs, they sprint until they're able to come to a higher point. Again, I'm very tempted to go into the feminist lens of this narrative, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to try and stick to the ethical richness of this experience. 
And this experience reminds us how human thriving emanates from the ability and the will to strive. As human beings, we are programmed to dream big, desire much, and we've been given the power and the intellect to achieve what we dream. The physical world has never limited us from what we wanted to do. We wanted to fly without wings, we've done it. We wanted to walk on the moon, we've done it. We wanted to explore the depths of the seas without gills, we've done it. We wanted to employ the sun and the moon and the universe and the satellite, we created artificial intelligence. We did it. And the ethical message of Sa'i is no matter where you're stuck, no matter how depressed or how dark that horizon looks, if we run for it, if we thrive towards it, we can make it possible. Human is as good as human striving. And human thriving depends on the energy and the impetus to strive against all odds. The fourth ritual is the ritual of doing nothing. Yes, doing nothing. There is one imperative ritual that every pilgrim must perform, and that is hanging out in the mountain of Arafat. I'm calling it hanging out because literally you don't do anything there. You pitch a tent and you sit there all day. When you ask the legal theorist, so what am I supposed to do here? Nothing. You just stay there. And the day is called the day of knowing, Arafa. Arafa comes from knowing. It's a day where you do nothing but meditate. You ponder. You think about who you are. You try to go back into your past. You relive all those moments that defined you as a person. You try to wonder how, if you ever make it past this day, you're going to curate your life going further. So it literally is a day of doing nothing but toying with your ideas, contemplating on your life experiences, figuring out what you're going to do when you move ahead from that station. It is called the halting place of Arafa, where you just stay there and you spend a whole eight hours doing nothing or perhaps doing the most important exercise that the busyness of this world and the hectic life will not let us do. And that is rest. Rest with our thoughts and rest with our emotions. The last ritual that I want to share with you is the ritual of picking pebbles. Yes? After they've hung out doing nothing, Muslims will move on to another valley, which is called the Valley of Muzdalifa, and there they will be tasked with collecting 70 tiny pebbles. And you will see 4 million people, like pigeons on the ground, moving away to find their pebbles. And these pebbles will be used the next day to pelt a wall which signifies temptation or the devil. And this exercise is an exercise of seeking moments within myself where I must find room for improvement. Sometimes with all the titles that we get in the life that we live, we think, you know, we've achieved it. But the human project is such that there is always room for improvement. And this exercise is not just picking pebbles, but it's picking all those things within me that I can work on and become a better human being. I want to summarize what I've said today with maybe just this one sentiment that the house of God for Muslims is meant to be a safe space. A safe space to think, a safe space for our bodies, and a safe space 
to be able to express our faith. And I think these are the ethics that we can bring to our world today, moving forward from 2023 into hopefully a post-pandemic era, where we're not just seeking a sanctuary for our bodies and our thoughts, but we're also wanting to become sanctuaries for our families and our communities around us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Majibi.